believe that this is the first time Mel Torme and Cleo Lane have been together in a recording studio, considering they share a 25-year friendship, a love of jazz, and that certain unmistakable scat style. <laughs> Being things never sings the same song the same way twice, and I, I've been accused of that too. I'm nowhere without you. They also share a longevity in the business that few can boast. Torme was on the stage at the age of four and Lane at the age of three, and their success has been punctuated by the inevitable show business disappointments that can only be sustained by an artist's passion. If it wasn't, then you would just sort of give up in, in many cases because it isn't a glamorous life by any means. No. And um, you have to come to terms with that. But I almost didn't, you know. I mean, I, when the incursion of rock came into being and really became pervasive, I kind of looked back and thought, I've had a good run. Now I'm going to become, now wait for it, wait for it, <laughs> An airline pilot. Well, I thought maybe I could be a bus conductor. You know, <laughs> that would be fun the with the change and the little, the little thing. Yeah. Yes, I see that. I go. Yes. I could. I said I can drive. I could be a chauffeuress. Yes, yes. All these things that you can turn. Many your head. possibilities. <laughs> Many. Lane has found them on the theatrical stage, and Torme at the typewriter. Having just finished his autobiography, he's about to release a book on Buddy Rich, and he's working on a novel. But for now, their attention is on a jazz album that brings together not only two great singers, but Lane's husband, composer John Dankworth. A combination they say... It's, it's wonderful because uh, we all have a, sort of the same sense of humor. And there is that lovely silver thread that runs between all of us. And winds up here. Gloria Hillard, CNN, Los Angeles. And Lynn Russell, CNN Headline News. This is CNN Headline News. Sunday, TBS presents a slice of the American way of life when most of us were just a preconceived notion. James Cagney, Elizabeth McGovern, and Howard Rollins. Ragtime, Sunday at 10.35 Eastern on TBS. On CNN Headline News tonight, does living near or working in a nuclear power plant raise your risk for cancer? Some new research may shock your notion of health and nuclear energy. On CNN Headline News tonight. From Turner Broadcasting System, this is CNN Headline News. The New Yorker, if it were like any other magazine, it couldn't possibly look like this. Now, wouldn't that be a shame? You see, week after week, the New Yorker publishes the best fact, fiction, humor, criticism, poetry, ideas, and entertainment guide in America. It's been called the best magazine in the world, probably the best magazine that ever was. See if you agree. Call this number and get 52 weekly issues of The New Yorker for just $25.95. That's $65 off the cover price. Call now and you'll also receive this reproduction of the very first New Yorker, published in 1925. This collector's copy is free with your paid subscription if you act now. The New Yorker. It's been called the best magazine in the world. Probably the best magazine that ever was. Now get 52 weekly issues off The New Yorker for just $25.95. Save $65 off the $91 cover price. Call 1-800-257-1333. CNN Headline News. I'm Lynn Russell. Congress is telling fellow coalition countries it's time to pay their share of the bill for the Gulf War. And they're warning there may be consequences if they don't. Today, the Senate passed a measure which will ban arms sales to Saudi Arabia, Germany, and Kuwait, and other allies until those countries send all the money they promised to help the United States pay for the war. The House passed a similar bill about two weeks ago. Lawmakers say they're upset with the payment delay. I do not recall any hesitation whatsoever on the part of the United States in employing the heart and brains and muscle 
of our military establishment to the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and its adjacent waters. There was no delay. We moved quickly and decisively, and so it is more than just a little disconcerting to see this kind of delay installing by those countries the defense of which we took up with no questions asked. The White House is playing down linkage between the return of U.S. troops from the Gulf and Iraqi unrest. Spokesman Marlon Fitzwater says the troop withdrawal is on schedule and it isn't tied to any one problem the Allies have with Iraq. The United States told Iraq last weekend using warplanes against rebels would threaten a final ceasefire. Many other problems need to be worked out before that final ceasefire is implemented. Wolf Blitzer has that. U.S. and Iraqi military officers have held regular meetings, but a formal ceasefire is not yet in sight. The main reason? Baghdad's campaign against domestic unrest. The United States has made it clear to the Iraqis that it will impose limits on Iraq's efforts to suppress the rebels. Uh, we have not spelled out a specific policy. What we have uh, conveyed to the Iraqis is that uh, they should not fly any fixed-wing combat aircraft, that they will be shot down if they do that. Using combat aircraft against civilian rebels violates the deal struck between Iraq and the Allies when hostilities ended last month. However, Pentagon officials say unrest inside Iraq appears to be spreading, so a ceasefire agreement looks even more elusive. Officials say four major problems must be resolved to win a ceasefire. Arrangements must be made to inspect Iraq's remaining ability to produce weapons of mass destruction. The Iraqis must agree to make financial reparations to Kuwait. And a less restrictive economic embargo must be worked out, one that permits shipping of food and medicine to Iraq, but not military hardware. But Saddam Hussein faces domestic challenges from Shiite rebels in the south and from Kurds in the north. Where the Iraqi government uses force or concentrates its force in southern Iraq, then the resistance dissipates. But once the government turns its back on that particular city, the resistance re-emerges. It's a different picture in the north. In the north, the Kurdish rebels have the upper hand. Despite the lack of progress towards a ceasefire, the Pentagon says 80,000 U.S. troops have already returned home. The overall withdrawal schedule, officials say, is still in place. They say most remaining forces will be out of the Persian Gulf region by July 4th. Although Pentagon officials believe Saddam Hussein will withstand this latest unrest, they maintain his days are numbered. Some analysts predict he will be gone before the end of this year, whether he flees Iraq, is assassinated, or is overthrown by a military coup. Wolf Blitzer, CNN, the Pentagon. An Iraqi opposition group based in London says Saddam Hussein's forces are attacking dissidents with Scud missiles, and rebel leaders report progress in their fight. They say their forces have seized much of Kirkuk, an oil-rich city about 150 miles north of Baghdad. To the south, both rebels and government troops claim they hold the Shiite holy cities of Najaf and Karbala. In Kuwait, the government reportedly has stepped down. Egypt's official news agency reports the crown prince, who's also Kuwait's prime minister, submitted his resignation to the emir today. He returned to Kuwait earlier this month to the cheers of many Kuwaitis. The report says the emir has asked the crown prince to form a new government. No reason for the resignation was given. A Lebanese group that claims to hold hostages is challenging Israel to release Arab prisoners. The Islamic Jihad for the Liberation of Palestine announced today that move was the only way to end the long hostage standoff. The statement included a color picture of Jesse Turner. The group claims it kidnapped Turner and Alan Steen in 1987. Six U.S. citizens and at least six Europeans have been held hostage since 1985 in Lebanon. Israel sent warplanes into southern Lebanon today. Rockets struck a guerrilla base just outside Sidon, wounding at least 15 people. A police spokesman claims most of the injured are civilian Palestinians. Palestinian sources tell United Press International one was a field commander for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. Partial returns are in from the Soviet Union's referendum on national unity. A referendum commission chairman told Parliament today 77% of voters approved Sunday's question on maintaining the union. An aide to President Mikhail Gorbachev calls it a victory for his reforms. Six Soviet republics boycotted the vote, but the presidential aide claims they only amount to 10% of the population. 
The British government has moved 500 more soldiers into Northern Ireland. That puts the total at about 11,000. The defense officials announced today two border checkpoints will be removed, leaving 16 in use. Jim Buchanan explains these seemingly mixed signals. This is one of the permanent army and police border checkpoints to go at Derryard in Fermanagh, visited by Mrs. Thatcher last November, a week before her resignation. Even then, the security forces had decided such posts had little strategic value and were considering closing some down. At one time, they placed great emphasis on heavily manned and heavily armed posts like these, not least as a visible deterrent of their presence at key crossing points along the border with the Republic. But two human bomb attacks last October at Newry and at Koshkrin near Londonderry, which killed six soldiers and one civilian, demonstrated that they're far from being invulnerable to terrorist attack. The Koshkwin post reopened a fortnight ago. At the same time, the army has introduced new stop and search and surveillance techniques, which they believe to be far more effective in securing the border. The decision to close the two posts in Fermanagh and also a number of minor roads was taken by the army commander in Northern Ireland, Sir John Wilsey, after talks with the Secretary of State, Peter Brook. But it will still leave 16 other major checkpoints along the border, although it's thought some of those will eventually go too. The extra troops from the Cheshire Regiment have already arrived in Ulster. They'll be used to increase the number of border patrols in the Fermanagh area while the checkpoints are being dismantled. Jim Buchanan, ITN, Northern Ireland. In Miami, two of Manuel Noriega's co-defendants face up to 40 years in prison and half-million dollar fines after their drug convictions today. Brian Davido and William Saldariaga were found guilty in a Guns for Drugs deal. Prosecutors maintain Noriega orchestrated the deal between the men and the Medellin cartel. Noriega is scheduled for trial in June. Closing arguments are to begin in the morning in the trial of Pamela Smart. The former New Hampshire high school teacher is accused of plotting her husband's murder with her teenage lover. Under cross-examination for a second day, Smart denied involvement in the killing. She said her admissions on police recorded conversations were only a ploy to get information. The chorus demanding the resignation of the Los Angeles police chief is growing ever louder. The Speaker of the California Assembly, the Los Angeles Times, and the county's largest union have joined the call for Daryl Gates to step down. Gates is under fire because of the videotaped beating of a motorist by officers. That motorist, Rodney King, has hired a lawyer who says King will sue LAPD for $56 million. A blue ribbon panel is calling on college presidents to rein in runaway athletic programs. A report from the Knight Foundation Commission says big-time college athletics have lost their bearings. The commission recommends college presidents should take charge of their athletic departments. The report also urges the adoption of stricter academic standards for athletes as well as stronger school control on funding for sports. Compliance would be verified by outside auditors. The report received an A-plus from the top man in college sports. I think people in higher education uh, should feel very good about it, very positive about it, uh, because it, uh, it really spells out uh, and provides a roadmap uh, to achieving uh, true integrity and true class in intercollegiate athletics. More than half the nation's major athletic schools were penalized in the 1980s for violating NCAA rules. The maker of the only government-approved drug for treating AIDS is under legal scrutiny. Burroughs Welcome is being sued by the People with AIDS Health Group of New York. The lawsuit alleges, among other things, the company withheld information from the U.S. Patent Office about the drug AZT. The group is hoping to get the drug's patent revoked so less expensive versions of the drug can be sold. Burroughs Welcome denies the allegations. A homosexual rights group is coming under scrutiny by federal authorities, but ACT UP says it's being targeted unfairly. Don Knapp has that. These gay right advocates make no secret of their contempt for U.S. Senator Jesse Helms. Uh, Jesse Helms is our single most uh, greatest public enemy in this country. Senator Helms, the activists say, would block spending for AIDS, block rights legislation for lesbians and gays, and they claim even jail people with AIDS. ACT UP began boycotts last summer of Philip Morris and its products, Marlboro Cigarettes and Miller Beer, because the companies have contributed to Helms political campaigns and to the Helms Museum. ACT UP says it was simply exercising free speech. 
The Federal Election Commission says there is reason to believe ACT UP violated federal campaign laws by not registering as a political well, committee. In terms of it being harassment, what's harassing at this point is that these groups who have very little money and very little precious time, and I'm serious, they spend their time trying to do something about AIDS, and most of the members of these groups have AIDS. Act up demonstrations tend to irritate many. The group has blocked morning rush hour traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge, interrupted a performance of the San Francisco Opera, and marched into meetings and restaurants to call for more spending for AIDS research. When I say harassment, you have to remember that uh, ACT UP's uh, uh, operation, method of operation is harassment. So it's uh, one group of crazies harassing another group of crazies as far as I'm concerned. Nonetheless, former California Democratic Party attorney Neil Eisenberg defends ACT UP. Most lawyers looking at this would say that it's more important to defend ACT UP in a situation like this than in normal situations because uh, the FEC cannot be allowed to go into fishing expeditions. The, the classic cases, again, talk about being careful against uh, uh, a chilling effect against legitimate speech. Ultimately, election law attorney Marty Ebert says it's a question of free speech versus the regulated speech covered by campaign laws. In the past, he says, a case like this would most likely be dropped. Don Knapp, CNN, San Francisco. And in headline consumer news, Big Blue takes a dive.